us kids forever never bothered me at all. I was a happy-ass kid with how is ass around. Snatching that money from my mom's hands, though, and leaving her to struggle trying to find money to feed us, that calls for an ass-kicking in my book, and this is my fucking book. Even if I don't ever see him until he's like 80, I have no choice but to beat his old ass. I'll fucking monkey flip his ass out of his wheelchair. <laughs> oh man, this is violent Jay's fucking book. Yep, this is his book. Welcome to Disaster Peace Publishing House. I'm Dev Solovey. I'm I'm Joan Metz. And this is a show about the Wild West of weird literature. The dramatic one, dramatic readings <laughs> included. Sorry, this was just such a powerful way to open it up. I, I I didn't feel all right going into our natural cadence. Yeah, like, no, no, no. This no. is this is just such a a banger of a uh, a subject yeah. to cover let, compared to what we usually talk about. Yeah, let me tell you, it's been hard uh, to sit on this because this we're going to be covering a book called Behind the Paint by Violent J. It's an autobiography. Violent J, if you're unaware, is one of the two frontmen of hip-hop duo ICP, Insane Clown Posse. Um, we'll get into that in a minute, but the whole book is written in that voice, um, and it has changed my life. Uh, <laughs> for the better. For the better, yeah, Usually, it's wonderful. Usually, when a book changes Dev's life, it's just to fold another secret cr- uh, tra- trauma crease into his brain. <laughs> <laughs> in new and wacky, fun, wild ways, but no, no this, this is, one, this one's just actually good. This this rules. This book rules. Deb, you have some exciting news about like just the coincidence. Yeah, I do. So I bought of this. When we chose to cover this. Yeah, let me. Let me I, I kind of want to go into the backstory of how I found this book. Okay, okay. Because <laughs> there's, there's just so much to cover. We're so excited. Yeah, yeah. I'm really excited. I've been sitting on this since the beginning of this year. So one of my favorite YouTube channels is Punk Rock NBA. He did a video called uh, The Secret Genius of ICP. Go watch it if you haven't. It's fantastic. Um, but he included quotes from this book, and they were banger quotes. Uh, they were really good. <laughs> Actually, let me just read the one that hooked me, that made me decide I needed to, to buy this book. Another thing that's interesting about this book, uh, I want to just say real quick uh, while you're looking for it, is it's written in a really interesting typeface, and it's like multimedia. Yeah, it's multimedia. There's pictures and stuff. This is the quote that got me to purchase it. We came bursting through the gates of the local band scene and strictly through hard, 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 hard hard-ass work. We surpassed all them lazy fucks within just days. It was like finally busting a nut after 20 years of jacking off. I finally had a purpose now. I was sure of this. No doubts at all. I never once doubted us. Not one time. Hell yeah. I I know. It rules, right? Again, like I said, the entire book is written that way. But I, I saw that quote in this video and I was like, I have to read this book. So I went searching for the book. It was printed in 2003. And at the time that I was searching for it, it was out of print. Uh, you could not find it anywhere except eBay, and the cheapest copy you could find was $50. However, as of literally like an hour and a half ago, there's been a huge development on this. Not only is the book back in print, if you're not wanting to spend a shitload of money on getting it, because it still does cost a shitload of money, there is a free audiobook on YouTube narrated by Violent J, and it kind of fucking rules. I strongly encourage you, I'll put a link in the doobly-doo, Please go listen to it. It's incredible. So with that out of the way, we, we can kind of give just like a brief overview. You wanted to talk about ICP, just a little bit about who they are. Yeah, sure. Um, I think that I became aware of ICP the way a lot of people from my generation did through irony. Uh, <laughs> I saw a lot of them because they did a lot of shit with, uh, with Adult Swim. And uh, yeah. uh, they're a... A hip hop group based out of Detroit. A lot of uh, their fan base is Caucasian, and they rap about clown shit. I, I want to um, uh, clarify the a lot of their fan base being uh, lower class Caucasian. Yeah, um, there's, there's a lot there's of the this... hate towards them is very much rooted in classism, and we'll talk about that. In yeah, a no, I, I was about to get into that. Uh, what I was going to say is like I, I think that uh, of a lot of. What I kind of got from ICP is that it's like, this is what the weird trailer park white boys listen to, you know? Yeah. And I don't mean that, like, in a bad way, just in a in a sort of vibe sort of sense. They, they were always, like, seen as this sort of weird thing to look at from afar. 
Dev, I think when we were you were driving me over to go record, you said uh, that they're like homestucks. They're they're tight knit, covered in face paint, and everyone keeps a twenty foot radius around them. That, that's essentially what it is, and I, I, you know, a lot of the hate for them does stem from the fact that people stereotype their fans as being trailer trash, as being methed out or whatever. And that's really disingenuous, especially coming from these like rich hipsters from San Francisco talking about it. Yeah, you know? I'm I'm never a fan of. When, when you talk about trailer trash, like, that, that's always just, just such a shitty way to describe, oh, poor people. Yeah. There's just poor people that, that are, like, in certain disaffected areas. You and the know? thing that, like, this book really imparted on me, because I've, I've always been against classism, but the thing that this really imparted on me is that I wish that people would view classism with the con- same contempt that they view other forms of bigotry because like classism it it seeps into other forms of bigotry as well but it's it's so rooted in capitalism that like if you're born poor unless you get really really fucking lucky you die poor and no one chooses to be poor either so it's not something that you can choose but everybody thinks it is and that drives me insane so there is this uh this initial wave of looking at uh icp as this freak thing to be punched down on and then a lot of people who wanted to do that just couldn't fucking bring themselves to because the guys themselves are jokesters. They've got like clown paint on. They're yeah. silly guys on purpose a lot of the time. So they just kind of bought into it. So there's this post ironic wave of juggalo appreciation, which yeah. is when I became aware of them. It, just like as this, it, oh, it uh, this is a it. misunderstood subculture that. I ain't into, it's got its problems, but it's not what people say it is. Yeah, and you know yeah. what? Just leave them be. You know what? These days, I trust a random juggalo more than I would trust a cop that lives next door yeah, to my ass. Same. Yeah, same. Absolutely. Uh, uh, juggalos are a a wide, genuinely diverse group, and it's they're, they're interesting and neat, and we're not here to make fun of them. No. We're here to talk about an interesting book written by an interesting guy who, yeah. fuck, th- since this is a relevant thing, hi, hi, Juggalos, we are, we are allies, we are fans, we're not gonna suck Violent J's dick, though. Yeah, yeah, we're um, just gonna, we're gonna talk are- about everything that's in this book objectively as it was, and we're also, I want to dive into a little bit of the specific context of Violent J's life, because especially the early parts of this book are very much a story about Detroit. And the reason he speaks, uh, or the reason ICP in general speaks to an audience that tends to be lower class is because Violent J is speaking to his own experiences growing up dirt poor in Detroit during the 70s and 80s. Yeah, now, you can you can say what you want about ICP, but there's nothing ingenuine about what they're doing. Yeah. They are they are singing from the fucking heart. And they're wearing especially, yeah. their, their clown paint on their sleeves. It's good, and, yeah. Yeah, I, I, that's what I appreciate about Juggalos, is like, you, you, I never feel like a Juggalo is, is like, fronting with you. Like, we're pro-Juggalo, we're allies. We're just in, so, I always like to put framing on the table, you know? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, we're going to be laughing a lot. Yeah, because Violent J is very funny, and he's funny on purpose, and his unique voice is, like, what makes this so endearing, but... I want to talk about, like, the fact that Violent J, like, he looks back on his child in in Detroit with nostalgia. And I think this is a lot of, like, what really irks me about, like, classism, especially as it relates to Detroit, is, like, people are so classist, it's so built in society, they find it inconceivable that uh, somebody could be nostalgic for growing up dirt poor. Like, Violent J words it really well. Again, he just words a lot of things well. But he words it well and he talks about it. He says, I hate when people front like, oh, I was raised so poor. It was horrible as a little kid. That's bullshit in my eyes. I think being broke-ass poor doesn't really affect you until you get to middle school and high school. That's when other people notice you have shitty clothes on, etc., etc. At the elementary school level of life, though, you don't really give a fuck if you're poor. Nobody does. Nobody notices dumb shit like that. All you really care about is playing, adventure, pretending, and all that fresh-ass little kid shit that comes for free in life. And, like, this, like, that, like, thanks, Violet J, you just destroyed classism, like, forever. Um, but, no, but for real, like, I want to talk about, so, I want to give some context for Detroit, because I feel like it's a great case study for just the logical end of the intersection of white supremacy and capitalism. And I know that was, like, a lot of, like, leftist 
you know, jargon language. Stick with us, Shuggle, as we yeah, promised. Yeah, stick with us. We're, the, we're, we're trying to say you're awesome. We're, we're, <laughs> we're, using, we're using different words to describe what I think might be a vibe you guys can fuck with. Yeah, yeah as particularly the vibe on the first album, Carnival of Carnage. That one is very much a, a critique of, like, rich people being assholes. And, like, it, it comes from Violent J's early experience in Detroit. So... Detroit, the height of its population was about 1.8 million, and that was in the 50s. After that, um, and especially during the civil rights movement, which was very strong in Detroit, having a large black population, there was a sharp decline during what was called the white flight. This is when like higher income white people left their areas, leaving lower income, generally people of color, confined to red line suburbs. And the world essentially kind of forgot about Detroit. And this continues to this day. There was a Drop in the population, you know, used to be almost 2 million. Now it's 600,000 and still dropping. And the, the like genocide tactics are continuing as well. I want to just put this out there. I have a friend from Detroit who I kind of consulted a little bit, just a little bit on talking about this book. And one of the things he said is like, um, I think if I were to suggest anything, it'd be to tell people that Detroit isn't brimming with violent crime. Its systemic poverty wasn't is designed and enforced by rich white business owners. Uh, for example, many of the beautiful buildings are kept intentionally unused to keep property taxes low. Its current artistic renaissance is built off the love and passion of its poor residents, and it's being stolen off of gerrymandering. Even the police are essentially running protection rackets there, like... And, and you know it's a it's a beautiful community that's kind of been stifled by the circumstances. This this uh, also is sort of the backdrop of the film Barbarian. Uh, a major part of that movie is is about how how these things uh, intersect with each other. Like it's just such a fucking obvious specific case study. Yeah, if that you it want seems another... to that everything that is about or near Detroit. Watch Robocop and Barbarian and read a little bit of history and you're like, oh I get it. If you want another really good but uh, wildly different tone, like autobiographical account of someone growing up in poor in Detroit, check out Writing My Wrongs by Shaka Singor. Writing is W-R-I-T-I-N-G. Um, he was a guy who went to prison when he was 19 for murder in Detroit, but it's due to his life circumstances and not so much malice. Uh, and it, it sort of highlights some of the injustices of the time. Detroit's fascinating, and I love the fact that Violent J is so nostalgic for it. He genuinely loves Detroit, even despite having a somewhat traumatizing childhood where he was forced to grow up very quickly where he had guns in his face where you know he was in a street gang and you know kind of spiraled out and lost his path but i want to sort of get to the core of icp's motives and particularly violent jay's purpose and his mission and the inception of that and so i wanted to tell you joan mm -hmm. the story of the butterfly okay yeah, so at the beginning of the book, he talks about two formative childhood moments. The Butterfly is the first one he mentions. Now, on the back of all of their albums, it says dedicated to the Butterfly. This is a story of that. So, the first thing happened when my brother Rob and I were running around in my ma's front yard in Berkeley. He was six, I was four, and we were chasing one of those colorful, humongous-ass butterflies. Suddenly, my brother started screaming, Joe, Joe, I got it! Rob had actually caught the Butterfly. I was pretty shocked. So was he. So was the butterfly, I'll bet. I don't really know how it happened, but I guess he jumped off the porch and actually cupped it in his hands midair. It's prying my hands open, it's so big, he yelled. Get the jar, get the jar. We had a jar with holes poked in the top, which we always kept on our porch because we'd always catch shit like grasshoppers or praying mantises, anything fresh. We put this <laughs> Yeah. He's right. <laughs> He's right, yeah. He's right. He, we put this giant butterfly in the jar, and we sat there staring at it. Wow, it was mad powerful looking. We noticed it had fur on its wings and all kinds of colors. It didn't even seem like an insect. It seemed more like a bird. We felt really guilty oh, about how... That's a cool fucking way to describe it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. We felt really guilty about having it in our jar, like we had caught somebody's dog. We said to each other, look, man, we're just going to have this butterfly spend one night at our house and we'll let it go in the morning because this is way too big and beautiful to keep. Besides, we don't know what it eats or anything. We have to let it go. We agreed. Just as soon as we got up the next morning, we'd let it go. That night, it would be our guest. We just wanted to hang out with it for a night. We poked extra holes in the jar lid and put a screen over it to hook it up more. We had a fan in our bedroom because it was mad hot and we put the jar right in front of the fan. The butterfly was our guest, and we wanted it to be extra comfortable. We tried to sleep, but we kept hearing the butterfly's wings hitting the glass of the jar like it was talking to us. 
It was the shit. We were mad excited. Next morning, all we could hear was the fan. My brother and I looked at each other in horror, then back at the jar. The butterfly was dead. We were straight up crushed. Right there, brother, we started fucking bawling our eyes out. We felt like we just murdered somebody. Actually, I guess we did. That sucked bad. So here's what we did. We dug a grave in the space between our house and the one next door. It was already a cemetery of sorts because this cat across the street was always killing birds and mice and shit. We would find the bodies of these animals and bury them in that area. There was this place across the street that sold potato chips in a big metal can, so we got an empty one and made it into the butterfly's final resting place. We put a little couch in there made out of napkins and popsicle sticks and all other kinds of cool shit. With tears in our eyes, we placed the can in the grave and filled the dirt on top of it. We felt so bad we made a vow right then and there, a vow that we continue to live by today. Quote, one day we will make it to heaven so that we can make sure the butterfly made it and so that we can apologize to that butterfly face to face. If insects are not allowed in heaven, then we would ask to change that policy on the butterfly's behalf. What the f- That is fucking beautiful. I know, right? What the f- well, maybe it's just the fact that my HRT has been fucking up, but I am actually tearing up at this. It, yeah. Wow, that so is... It's beautiful, right? And, and that it is continues. a genuinely beautiful story. It continues. Um, so, <laughs> now, if you look on every single ICP album and EP, what does it say in the credits? Dedicated to the butterfly. It's right on the inside of my left arm, a big tattoo of a butterfly, also dedicated to the butterfly. I dedicate every major accomplishment in my life to the butterfly. I do this to remind myself of our important vow. We must both keep on track all the way through life. I'll tell you why. Because back then, that day burying that butterfly, feeling the way we did, my brother and I were like two clean cloths, unpolluted yet by life, pure and true. When we made that vow, we were the real untouched Joe and Rob Bruce. It was from the heart. As we go through life, we adapt to what really goes on in this world and what it teaches us. Other people in life teach you things like, hey, man, don't hang out with girls unless you're trying to fuck them, dude. Or what are you hanging out with those black kids for? The more you come into contact with other people, the dirtier you get. When you're a child, you only go by your heart because that's all you know. As I grew up, I remind myself out loud. I made that vow when I was as pure as could be before the world got me. When the only thoughts I had were the thoughts that were my own and in my heart. I cannot let the world fuck me up so bad that I lose faith in that vow. Hey, what the fuck? As I write this, I'm fucked up. I'm very, very dirty from the world. One day, I have to return to that innocent, pure thing that I once was. So when I die, I can apologize to the butterfly. That's what it means. That's exactly what I intend to do. Okay, let me put it to you like this, and this is where it gets funny. <laughs> <laughs> if I was sitting on a public bus next to an old lady, and I said a cuss word like fuck out loud, she'd probably be offended. She might even make a face and say something about it. Well, don't think she didn't spend her life sucking on dicks, being human, and cussing herself, right? <laughs> the only difference between her and I is that now she returned to that pureness she once had as a child. She'd been all the way around the block. She'd probably seen it all before, and now she doesn't even want to hear the word fuck. She wants to be clean again. There was a time when she was swigging booze, fucking around, tossing salads, sucking some guy's dick at a dance, and all that. Now, she has cleansed herself of that craziness. The old people you and I don't care about, those are the wisest fucking people out there. They're the ones who've seen it all. They tasted both styles of life, and now in their old age, they choose pureness because they're wise. What was I talking about? Oh yeah, the butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost done, just listen. Everything that I do, everything I do that I care about is dedicated to the butterfly. I take something so filthy, so raunchy, so devoted to hate and revenge and anger, like my albums, and I stamp dedicated to the butterfly on them, because that was Joe Bruce who made that vow. Today's Joe Bruce wouldn't make that vow, but the future Joe Bruce will, and I will become him again one day in the future. Just don't say fuck next to me on a bus when I'm 90, or you might get my cane upside your melon. <laughs> so that is the story of the butterfly. Yeah. Um, that was a journey, right? Yeah, no, that's a great way to frame him. You know, I think there's something about ICP, too, and, like, the whole vibe of it that makes people uncomfortable is the way that they're willing to actually admit and confront that shit, not yeah. in a look at us, we're so cool, we're trying to justify it way, but in a we are perpetually caught in the cycle of violence sort yeah. of way. 
just this really raw, sort of silly, genuine expression of, of being aware of just how fucked up your lot in life is and being able to just embrace it. Yeah, and like, I, I want to talk a little bit too about how his, his life experiences kind of informed his music. Because, you know, from here it goes on with his life story. Uh, for example, he had a stepfather who was a molester, who was an abuser. Um, and so a lot of his music, there, there's a lot of songs from ICP that are about finding predators and abusers and just violently murdering them. Let's go! I know. It's the same with um, racists. He feels very strongly about racism because of... Uh, uh, like, he's always felt strongly about it, but particularly because of a period of time he spent in North Carolina in a very, like, Confederate, very racist town. And it drove him insane. He, he didn't even like seeing... He calls them rebel flags. He didn't like seeing Confederate flags. And so they have that song, Your Rebel Flag, which is literally about finding racists and just kicking the shit out of him it's you know he he knows that he's a, a violent person especially he has that past being in a street gang and like he knows that the world kind of imparted that on him that he was forced to be violent in order to survive in detroit as it was but he's you know he's taking that vow he's taking that desire to get to heaven uh and for his his fans to get to heaven too and he, he's he wants to direct that violence towards people who deserve it and that's something he states explicitly in his book, too. You know, he's not mysterious about it in any way. This book was written after... Gee, what's his name again? <laughs> Violet J, yeah. Yeah. This book was written, like, after they finished um, the uh, uh, the Wraith Shangri-La, and they were working on the Wraith Hell's Pit. So that was the, the sixth Joker card. Yeah, published in 2003. And it's um, it's really a journey. It's a wonderful book, and it's full of, like, tons of funny anecdotes. <laughs> Do you have any? I, I kind of just want to see where your head's at. Yeah. Um. No. I, I. I. feel like there's a reason why his his work vibes with people so hard. It vibes with troubled people uh, who are troubled yeah. in the same way he was, and who you know he can kind of sort of bring them to the light. Hopefully, you know. Right? You know. A lot of times when people talk this sort of shit, it ends in a "and we will bathe them in cleansing fire" sort of way. <laughs> But, you know, Juggalos are just like, hey, man, we're all riled up. So if you're in the right place at the right time to fuck up a bigger asshole than you, can take it. <laughs> yeah. that's kind of that's the Juggalo vibe, you know? Yeah, pretty much. There, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there is one song that I like by ICP. and It's not like one my favorite song ever. Like, I can't listen to it over and over again. But like, and for the most part, I don't like the music. But this one is called I'm a Kill You. It fucking slaps. <laughs> oh, I know I'm gonna kill you. Yeah, yeah it rules. That's your best song. <laughs> yeah, it fucking yeah. rules. Yeah, because it is yeah. just about like finding just awful people and beating the shit out of them. There's, yeah, there's something cathartic about that. Yeah, no, like like I said, there's a period in uh, Adult Swim history where it's just ICP were like rotating folk, genuinely fucking funny dudes with great stage presence. Yeah, for um, sure. Their sense of humor was a part of uh, kind of. How they oh wanted God. to integrate their their sort of shtick, which we can get into. The, uh, yeah, there we go. That That's what I really respect about ICP. And also kind of explains why I don't necessarily, like, swim in those waters myself. It's like, it's it vibes with an amateurish vibe, you know? Yeah. Like, these guys are just getting the fuck in there and doing it themselves because it's what they want to make. And there's this sort of, like, crunch to it. They just happen to have, like, that sort of, like, homegrown vibe that... It's yeah. really nice to see make it, even if it ain't my shit. You know, yeah. Well, they to are like in, in almost, way, yeah, like almost a hundred percent homegrown. They did a lot of that yeah. work by themselves. I want to since since we were kind of like talking about their their shtick a little bit. I wanted yeah. to before the break read um, like how they came up with the idea for their like their clown sort of brand because at, at the time it was like nineteen eighty nine. Gangster rap was at its height, and that's kind of what they started out doing, but they realized it, it kind of wasn't enough for them to stand out. Now, there was a subgenre of hip hop that was popular in the Midwest at the time called horrorcore rap. Um, you saw this with uh, folks like Esham, for example. He was also on the Detroit rap scene, and he is, in fact, like friends with ICP now. Um, and he's mentioned in this book several times. But I wanted to go into kind of how they came up with the idea for the insane clown posse. So we'll tell it in um, Violent J's words. We talked in Alex's mom's basement. Quote, look at LA, for example. First came NWA, then came Compton's Most Wanted, Above the Law, WC, and Mad Circle. Everything else is gangster rap, right? 
All these rappers are doing gangster rap in LA. Gangster rap is known worldwide as LA's style of rap. Well, what's Detroit's style of rap known for? The unholy Eshan. Then you got redneck ass Kid Rock. This is some crazy ass cartoon shit. Maybe the reason nobody's buying dog beats is because we're just doing some of that same old gangster rap, like everybody else. Man, we ain't from fucking LA. Why don't we just get brave and add this crazy Detroit sound? Like Esham, let's do what we're about, the wicked shit. Let's make Detroit the home of the true horror shit. Only fuck that shit. We ain't gotta rap about no devil shit. We'll discover our own shit. More moons had gone by. Quote, let's add our own sick humor too. Let's create something brand new. Look at Detroit's music scene. It's crazy. You've got a redneck kid from 28 Mile Road and devilish 666 rapper. This is fucking music for the mad. Let's tap into our creative side. Let's dig deep. Find what pisses us off. Let's keep it real, y'all. According to most people, we ain't the shit. We're scrubs. We are and always have been broke as fuck, and we know we ain't tough gangsters. We've been getting fucked off. Our whole lives, we've been the scrubs. We might as well rep that in some way. Let's rap about the shit that makes us want to become serial killers, just to let it all out. You know, let's dig deep inside and pull out the stupid shit that makes us who we are, and let's rap about it. Let's put our biggest fears and angers on tape. Everybody can relate to their own dark side, no matter where you're from. Of the end quote. Everybody was down. Then we all agreed the gangsta-ass name Inner City Posse didn't really fit where we were headed. All the real members of the ICP gang upped and quit after Dog Beats made a few little waves anyway. Joey and I both agreed to keep the ICP part. We felt we still needed to rep the letters ICP to let everybody out there always know Inner City Posse's last two members never left and died out. We are still ICP, bitch. Sick! <laughs> uh, quote, how about ice cold pimps, inner city players, inner city psychos, and cr insane crazy psychos? We went through anything you could think of. Then, I remembered the dream I kept having about the clown running around in Del Rey. I would still have those dreams every now and then, and this clown was becoming almost something real to me. In some dreams, he'd be trying to talk to me, but I would only see his mouth move and no sound coming out. <laughs> yeah, baby! <laughs> Sometimes I would chase after the clown, but he's always too quick to catch. Then the name for ICP just kind of popped into my head. As I was having these thoughts, an excitement began to build inside me. I have it. Listen, I said. I got that Detroit shit. Everybody liked our clown guy, right? Plus, our shit is going to have tons of our own twisted humor mixed in, right? Clowns. We're scrubby ass killer clowns. Then it hit me all at once. Boom. Let's all paint our faces like clowns and be the insane clown posse. Clowns who murder and kill people who deserve to be murdered or killed. Whoosh. And it came about just like that. So that's kind of the story of how they put together their yeah. brand. Just so much context for a specific scene when, like, <laughs> it's like, oh, obviously! Yeah, yeah. And the fact that they fucking stuck it out so long to to be, like, something to rubberneck out, that they have outlived their roots while still representing it. And that's yeah. fucking cool as hell. Yeah, no, it is really cool, and not I, to say that the horrorcore scene isn't like a thing because it still is. But like, yeah, it's it's changed. You know? It's it's changed. Like they're they're representing like late eighties vibes. Yeah, still. late eighties, early nineties. That that's that's why they're so weird and yeah. interesting. I think their first like album album uh, at, as part of like the Joker cards. The first card was in nineteen ninety two, Carnival of Carnage, and that's the one that kind of tackles social issues most i think as relates to their specific local area and it's why they got so big in the detroit underground for a long time i feel like i had a comment to make but i lost it so if you want to take a break now you can that was a good time for a break we'll be right back y'all all right we'll be back whoop, whoop. Whoop, whoop. Welcome to the amazing digital ICP reading. <laughs> I'm gonna start off. We, we were talking about. Wait, I, I'm, I'm just dating this episode by making an amazing digital circus reference. <laughs> Most of our episodes are dated, I think. Um, what? No, they're, they're timeless. What are you talking about? <laughs> Fuck you, Dev. Okay, the gummy bears one's definitely gonna be timeless. <laughs> there we go. Um, but, we uh, will die, but that episode never will. No, uh, <laughs> we were talking. We were talking about the Detroit rap scene, and there are a couple of very famous rappers that came out of Detroit. Famous people in general. But I want to read you this story, and then we're going to play a game afterwards. Okay. okay. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> All right. Uh. So. 
I'm embracing the dark carnival. <laughs> yeah, well, good. This, this is the perfect time to do it. Here, here it begins. Finally, I decided on the place we were just at last night, St. Andrew's Hall. I knew that they still hosted hip-hop nights on Friday, so that's where we headed. We walked in, and right away, the hound dogging got out of control. One kid in particular came up to me and gave me a flyer. It read, EP release party, blah, 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 featuring appearances by Esham, Kid Rock, and ICP, parentheses, maybe. That pissed me off. Why was this kid giving me a flyer that advertised our name with a maybe after it? What kind of bullshit was that? He might as well put featuring fucking Madonna. Who knows, right? I mean, <laughs> anything's possible. The bitch might show up, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I asked the kid, why do you have our name on this flyer? The kid said, it says, maybe. Maybe you'll be there. I don't know. That's why I'm asking you right now. You guys coming to my EP release party or what? What's <laughs> 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 on this kid? Fuck no, I ain't coming to your party. You might have if you would have asked us first before putting us on the fucking flyer like this. We don't even know who the fuck you are, so don't be trying to trick jugglos into thinking we'll be there. I'm going to give you three guesses as to who that kid was. Oh my fucking god. Yeah. Okay, we it's, know. One of, it's one of three, and I'm going to end with the one that I know that it is. And when it is this guy, I'm going to kill myself. Okay. okay. No, it's tr- either Trent Reznor. No. No. Eminem. No. It's, it's... Oh, that was oh, that, oh, and yeah, we parted ways. Who was that Fred kid? Durst, isn't it? Yep, you guessed it. Who could ever have known what would all become that one ninety second Fred encounter? Durst. That was the Fred first Durst. and last time I have ever met the future superstar Eminem face to face. Oh, 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 okay. Yeah, you got okay. it on the second try. Second try, okay. okay. Yeah. Oh man. Um, but yeah, no, Eminem. Well, because Eminem yeah. had like beef with them for yeah. a long time. Eminem. Yeah, that's right, because. Yeah, he he was insane, right? Yeah, he was in the rap scene. Not only that, I found out that in this particular anecdote, Eminem was not a kid. He is actually the exact same age as Violent J. Both of them were born in 1972. And they were on the rap scene around the same time, too, but ICP made it big before he did. I want to also talk a little bit about the rabbit hole this, that I went down on this, because I, I noticed they were both born in 72, and I remembered, I, I also know of another famous musician born in 72, Billy Joe Armstrong, and so I was like, who the fuck else is born in 1972? And so I googled it. A lot of people, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, Idris Elba, um, fucking Jude Law, apparently. Uh, it's like, Just a lot of celebrities that you go... They're Gwyneth different Paltrow. ages? They're different ages? Yeah, Gwyneth Paltrow is on there, too. Uh, um, gooping it up. Yeah, who else? there was, like, a lot of Carmen Electra was on there. there was oh, a lot of, like, imagine the imagine the sound that ICP could have come up with if they just had access to that jade egg back in the 80s. <laughs> I just think it's funny, because, like, also, the, like, Green Day, I love Green Day, I'm a huge fan. The one take they've had that I disagree with is that they don't like rednecks, and, like, I'm, I'm out here saying, like, that's a bad take. And I'll admit that, because that's exactly what, like, a lot of the classes and the dunks on, you know, bands that don't really deserve to be dunked on. I don't know where I'm going with that, but... No, uh, (laughs) if I I could plug another comedian that I like quite a bit, there's... There's a southern comedian that I like quite a bit named Billy Wayne Davis, and he's got, like, a really thick southern draw, and a lot of the purpose of his comedy is to, like, actually talk about in a genuine way without just, like shitting on people from the south like actually talk about the south and what it's like yeah yeah um and what's great about his comedy is the fact that there's like a celebration of it you know Mm -hmm. yeah yeah no i love that yeah it we we are pro poor people here no matter where they come as long as you ain't a racist piece of shit yeah we are are anti-classism we are anti-classism that all being said do you want to hear some funny anecdotes yes (laughs) all right um oh man what to pick what to pick um, first, this one's probably the first one that made me, like, really have to put down the book because I was laughing so hard. Yeah, so in the early days of ICP, like, obviously there was a lot of beef, like, on the streets, and it would, it tended to erupt oh. in fights. And so Violent J is telling the story of something that happened after one of their shows. He says, anyway, they were fighting some dude, basically whooping his ass. Then the dude's bitch jumped in. She got tossed to the floor hard. I thought it was funny, but my homie Greasy didn't. He jumped in and tried to break up the whole fight. He was my boy, so I had his back. I thought, man, if anybody swings on Greasy, I gotta swing on them. Sure enough, one of them hit Greasy. So I put a guy who was in front of me in a headlock. 
I was going to do this backward suplex move that I was known for doing from time to time. I can usually cripple a kid with this move, but not this time. Boom. I felt a hundred blows light up the back of my head from the rest of this guy's crew. <laughs> I can't front, y'all. They lit me up. No exaggeration. Had to be about three or four guys punching me at once. I tried to get away. I just took off running forward at full speed. Suddenly, I felt a sharp, blinding pain in my chest. Felt like a bullet hit me. No. I realized I'd been stabbed. I stopped running and looked at my chest while the Bob Marleys caught up to me and kept beating on my head. You want me to be honest in this book? How is this for honesty? That shank went in so deep and so hard that I shit my drawers right there. Oh my god. <laughs> yup, I shit my pants. I didn't know it at that second, but I found out a minute later. How's that for honesty? I could have le just left that part out. Man, I should have gripped a poop. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Maybe the knife hit a poop nerve or something. <laughs> I started running again with Shab and his band on my ass, swinging nothing but lethal blows. I don't know how I stayed conscious. <laughs> so that's one of the ones that made me laugh out loud. It's great, right? And that's another one of the things I love about ICP. They don't take themselves too seriously, you know? Oh, my God. It, it's, really, it's really wonderful that he's just like, yeah, I'm going to lay it all bare. What? <laughs> I should a, a, a brick of poop? I <laughs> should a grip of poop. I should a grip of poop. I know, it's iconic, Maybe right? that knife hit a poop nerve. <laughs> oh my god, what a poet. I know, it's a great book, what right? What a poet. He's a poet. He really, uh, literally, he's a rapper. So, like, yeah. actually. Yeah, I'm not a, being hyperbolic. No, no, we're being, that's factually accurate. It's, um, it's funnier than Weird Al Yankovic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and, like, that's the thing, is, like, even though Violet J did drop out in the ninth grade, he's still a great writer, because you have to be a good writer to be a rapper. Um, oh, yeah. So, yeah, it's, like, it's awesome. This is great. That's one very funny anecdote. There's one which I like to call the worst coming out bisexual coming out story, and there's the car scene headrest. <laughs> I don't know, take your pick. Car seat headrest? <laughs> Like the band? No, that's... Oh. It's a... Um, I'll read it to you. Okay. <laughs> so, um, for context, there was a period of time... Oh! It's, I don't know if it's what you think it is. Uh, there was a period of time in which they were in the WWF, because Violent J and Shaggy 2 Dope also used to be wrestlers. Um, and for a while, that was actually a career path that Violent J wanted to go on. So wrestling in the WWF, making cameos, was like a dream come true for them. But the problem was, they weren't being paid to do it, and the WWF wasn't airing ads for them like they said they would. So they quit the, uh, the deal. But Violent J t has some very colorful descriptions of some of these wrestlers that he met. That whole month before we quit the WWF was crazy, though. The lady who booked all the wrestlers' flights would call us up and ask us how many first-class plane tickets we needed. So we'd ask around the room and see who all wanted to go to WWF with us that week. We'd just say six. Alex, Dan, Curtis, Jamie, and Paul from Twisted would come along just for the hell of it, because they got a kick of seeing how nuts these wrestlers were. Let me tell you, they were. Gold Dust, especially. Like, for real, that guy was crazy for real. <laughs> I've we heard. were we were in New York, and Alex walked by him in the hallway. He was just sitting on the floor in the hall. Hey, come here, Gold Dust said. So Alex asked, "Say what?" Gold Dust said flat out, "My pussy stinks." Does it stink? My pussy stinks. <laughs> <laughs> Alex just walked away like, "Whoa!" <laughs> then we walk into a locker room. We walk into me a locker too. room. Hey, hey, me too, girl. <laughs> me too, girl. Me too. Uh, we walk into a locker room and he'd be lying on the floor on his side, humping the wall. Okay, bro, maybe we'll look for some clean towels somewhere else. <laughs> 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 there were a lot of drugs in the WWF too. I can see why with all that travel and fuck up schedules. See, Jamie and Paul, uh, Jamie and Paul have twisted, had their fresh Coolio hair, and I don't know why, but everyone thought they were coke dealers. Wrestlers were always asking Twisted for dope. Every time we turned around, something happened. Literally. I was telling a story to Twisted one time, and I was like, and it was like, boom. I spun around with my arms out. Right then, my hand just perfectly cupped the titty of none other than Jacqueline, one of the super hot diva chicks in the WWF, who just happened to be walking by. 
Her titty felt nice, but fake, too. Felt a little bit too hard, cold, and kind of stiff. Just big and siliconed out. Her titty felt kind of like a car seat headrest, only shaped like a super titty. (laughs) Damn, I'm sorry. (laughs) Car seat headrest. (laughs) It's good, right? Yeah. You can imagine a boob feeling like that. You alright? Slap Jacqueline on the titty. Oh my god. <laughs> like a car seat headrest. A car seat headrest. No, that's not where I thought I was going at all. No, it's not. <laughs> I literally thought it was that they had beef with the band car seat headrest. No, but they do have beef with Radiohead if you want to hear Let's go! That. Perfect transition! Yeah. <laughs> okay. That was our thing. One little thing we had out there. We didn't want to be seen without our makeup. It kills the flavor. It's like a wrestler being seen without his mask. It just makes it so it ain't much fun. While we were painting up, this weird looking guy opened the door and walked in. Billy, who's really like the nicest guy ever until you got a problem, kind of had to put up a little front. He had no idea who this guy was or if he belonged there. He just knew we needed to put our makeup on. So Billy told him, hey partner, you gotta get out of here. They're putting your makeup on. The guy shot back with the I'm one of the fucking bands playing tonight, man, speech. Billy grabbed the door. That's all right, but you still got to get out of here. And he shut the door. Then the dude opened the door again. It came right back in because, of course, rock stars don't like to get told they can't do something. I want to see what's going on. I'm in a fucking band. I'm in Radiohead. (laughs) Whoever the fuck. Billy pushed him politely in the chest, just doing what he was supposed to do. Back up, back up, dog. Let them put their makeup on. They'll be out to say hi to you in a minute. How fresh is that? Billy thought he was fucking Hound Dog stagehand or something. So oh, Leo, we, what a king. S- truth was, he could have been Michael Jackson. Just stay the fuck out of our dressing room while we're getting ready. Yeah. Again, door swung open. A guy was standing in the doorway yelling at us. Why am I being treated like this, man? Billy took his foot and slammed the door right in the guy's face. Then the guy opened the door again and ran in. Billy grabbed him by the neck, bounced him off the fucking wall about seven times, knocking over a table full of food and drinks in the process. I told you to get the fuck out of our dressing room. He was choking the shit out of this little crumpet-speaking English dude, and we loved it. (laughs) Billy held open the door with his foot and threw the guy into the hallway. He somersaulted like a bowling ball. The show, of course, sucked. There were only about 150 people left in the whole building by the time we played. After Radiohead played, the crowd filed out like there was a bomb threat or something. Afterwards, we told Julian what happened. A guy from Radiohead tried to come in? Which guy? We didn't know. We just knew this guy who looked like a retarded Martin Short wouldn't fucking let us put our makeup on in peace. You know who that is? Julian asked us, starting to laugh. We had no idea what or who Radiohead was. We just thought he was some hotshot who walked into our dressing room, got fucking slammed around, which is how our band has always operated. We came to play, not see what's going on in the other dressing room. We're nerds, remember? That guy was the fucking lead singer of Radiohead, Julie said. You decked Tom York from Radiohead. You guys are the fucking shit. Yeah, that is so <laughs> fucking cool. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> it's kind of great, isn't it? That was killer. Oh my god. Hey, hey, Billy did nothing wrong. <laughs> Billy did nothing wrong. Hey, Tom Nor- York, I know you're listening. <laughs> you had it coming, dude. Yeah. If you're willing to come on the show and talk about it and finally apologize, you know, we're here for you. <laughs> but until then, get fucked. Don't do that. There's one last one that I could tell about Billy nearly getting shot. Yeah, I'd love to hear that. Uh, it's also, I, I, in my notes, I called it the worst bisexual coming out story. Uh, and I couldn't remember what that went, meant until I revisited it today. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, I see A, I see C. I'm interested to hear where, where B helps them transition. Yeah, let's see. We came home. We were out of money. The RV was breaking down. Riddlebox was stuck at about 100,000 sales. We hated our label, Jive, more than anything. Worse than all this, Billy almost lost his life, along with his boy, Rob Two, in a shootout on Gratchit Avenue. What happened was, Billy and Rob Two were out promoting Riddlebox and a Riddlebox fan, and there were these suburban gangsters who pulled up next to him at the traffic light. 
One of the gangsters was in love with a skank who was fucking one of our employees named Billy the Kid. Anyway, this wannabe gangster, we'll just call him Crybaby for the rest of this story, pulls up next to the van and starts yelling out the window, Fuck psychopathic! So Billy throws a big pipe wrench out the window and smashes their front windshield. Then Crybaby pulls out a pistol, starts to shoot at the van, all for the love of he has for his skank. <laughs> About six bullets tore through the van. Rob, too, caught one in the leg, and a fragment of the bullet hit his head, but it didn't penetrate his skull. Billy's fate was beyond explanation. There were four bullet holes in the jacket he was wearing, but he was not hit at all. Two bullets went in and out of his jacket in such a way that they never touched him. The dark carnival spirits, guardian angels, or just plain luck, something was there with Billy that day to save his ass. Billy took off through the red light as they were being shot at, while Crybaby and his crew were stuck behind another car at the light and couldn't move. This gave someone the time to take down their plates. Needless to say, Crybaby was in jail the next night, crying about the love he lost, but even more so about the new love he found within the prison walls. It is rumored that after he finally got out, he found other loving arms to fall into, only these ones were more hairy and muscular than the ones he was accustomed to. Hey, good for you, buddy. Yep. <laughs> That's the worst bisexual coming out story. Uh, also, fucking Billy escaping death. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. Hey, look, all I'm saying is the moment that someone realizes that they're bisexual <laughs> is the moment that a miracle happens. And if you get caught up in it, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I will say, like, they mentioned in, in their Jive. Jive Records was the first company they were signed on with. There's really only one group of people that Violent J hates, and it's rich people. And he makes that clear very much at the beginning, but their vitriol for the music industry at the time, it, it's really apparent uh, in, in a lot of the, these stories. Because not only are they saying, like, rich people are fucked up and, like, the evil power of money in, in Violent J's words, but it's also, like... It, you know, it was reinforced by their terrible experiences with these record companies. There's one last quote, uh, you know, and this just kind of like exemplifies the sort of vitriol that they felt for these people and like the kind of how two faced these record companies were. So what Jeff Fenster, the rep from uh, Jive, said, he says, yeah, you started off slow, but you guys kept working that shit. You got it up to 80000 then then 100000 What you did in Dallas was impressive, too. We're going to keep you on for another record. Je uh, Violent J says, in other words, this is what Jeff was really saying, was, yeah, man, we just thought we'd get maybe 70000 out of you guys in Michigan. That would make us some good money. But much to our surprise, you guys went out and spent your own money to promote the album. You guys ended up working Riddlebox all the way up to 100000 now we're super paid from you idiots. We want you guys to do it all over again with your new album. Please open your butts a little wider so we can fit another big dick up in there. <laughs> <laughs> what a king! I know, yeah, he really, like, he tells him off. Th this, this dude, like, he yeah. knows what's up. There's no other way to put it. Like, yeah. he understands the way the world works, and he has such a <laughs> unique way of expressing it. Yeah, yeah, a, a way that's unique, not just, yeah. like, to his subculture, but also to, like, Detroit, you know? Like, the, yeah. his experience of, of being there and being this, like, kind yeah. of unique bubble of America is... Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, like, he, he's done some fucked up shit. Like, we didn't talk a lot about some of the more... Yeah. You know, morally dubious things yeah, that like he, he would fess, he's fessing up to, you know, yeah, he'd be the first person to tell you about. He, he fesses up to it in um, this book. He was in a street game for Christ's sake. I mean, yeah. that's honestly, uh, to, to, to bring this to a winding down point, yeah. what I find uh, most enjoyable about him is that, that naked, brutal honesty. Yeah. I, I said it at the beginning of the episode, I'll say it again. They are very real. I don't, I don't think there's anything that has ever come out of their mouth that's a fucking lie. Yeah, no, I, I would think so, too. He doesn't know how to express it like you would in a college essay, but through his music, he expresses the kind of, like, what classism does to you and, and the, the kind of environment it creates with ghettos and things like that. And he's also, he talks about these issues that are personal to him, racism, predators, that sort of thing. There's I mean, a lot there, of good messaging in there. there. There's a reason why people understand the world and get all that shit because of ICP and not because of leftist theory. Exactly. You know, yeah. I, I think it's just like a good a good reminder that there's a lot of different ways to express a lot of same ideas and yeah. you shouldn't let labels or anything like that keep you from 
feeling like you can't make a connection with another human being mm-hmm. that might have more in common with you than you might think. Exactly. exactly. Uh, and maybe we should be appreciating the people who are mm-hmm. honest about the ways that they have affected the world, the good and bad ways, more than we should about people who try to be a hero, I guess. Yeah. I respect Violent J a lot. I respect Juggalos quite a bit. Y'all keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. Go listen to the audiobook of this, by the way, on YouTube for free, or purchase the book on Amazon and read it. Like, please do, seriously. Yeah, one one of the things that you were saying uh, is the thing right now is they're doing their farewell tour because he has... uh, AFib. Yeah. Yeah. It's a heart arrhythmia that can, you know, lead to further issues. They're doing a felt well tour, so they're not going to be touring anymore. I feel like Violent J burnt bright but burnt fast because, like, a lot of the early days was literally 24-7 promoting. Day and night, in and out, no breaks whatsoever. And so, you know, a lot that, that catches up to you, right? And he's also got, like, his panic disorder. He talks about that in his book in very candid detail uh, in some ways that are kind of genuinely terrifying, Um generally visceral there's other stuff in this book that's great that we didn't get to talk about the yeah, uh, dark carnival the devil's night which was a very detroit specific thing a lot of other stuff just go read it it's good yeah <laughs> uh you know uh for for what it's worth if there's any way that this made it to your ears violent j shout out to you for keeping it real for so long take care of yourself brother yeah yeah uh, rest up get healthy yeah um, dude you're you're appreciated by folks, I I don't think you would think would. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's all we're trying to say. It's like, uh, you know, open up everybody. Open up your fucking hearts a little. Yeah, uh, uh, give ICP the respect they deserve. Yeah, uh, <laughs> whoop whoop and happy Halloween. Whoop whoop. <laughs> oh, we we forgot to do like plugables at the end or anything like that. Oh yeah, you should do that, huh? All right. Well, our theme music is done by yeah. Arya. Yes. At- Two glitch on all the stuff that she's on. Yeah, um, our theme music by Aria is. Thank you again, Aria, for making the music for this dumb dumb show. The the link to her card is in the description. Please go ha check ha, it out. Now, now you're inextricably linked to Juggalos, and now <laughs> your world is going to get so much bigger and more beautiful than That's you could possibly right. imagine. We're all down with the clown. Yeah, man. we're all down. We're with the down clown. with the clown. I mean, we made a comparison to Homestuck, though. I don't want to. I, I don't want that to seem like tacit Homestuck endorsement. Though. No. I just want to put that. Out there. <laughs> yeah, we're not endorsing Homestuck. We're not endorsing Homestuck. Homestuck. My call to action is to actively unendorse Homestuck. <laughs> right. Do whatever you can to to limit Homestuck's influence. Yeah, on your life. I do have to plug my Patreon. Kind of in dire straits at the moment. If you like the content, it helps a lot. Please, <laughs> we really appreciate it. You Contribute know. to the buy Dev a pizza fund. <laughs> yeah, that's literally like basically just paying for dinner at this point so you know and then like all the rest of my plugs are the same webtoons devil went down to vegas calling the faithful all that they're currently on hold in the moment again for financial reasons but you can still read the chapters that are up also um i will be featured in a publication from the arizona authors association yeah one of their contests uh which i'm really excited about i'm gonna learn how i placed in november uh, we're also going to be doing a theme month for November. I figure I should announce that. Uh, oh, yeah. Drum roll. Elder Scrolls. Whoa! <laughs> Elder Scrolls. Scroll Vember is here. Yeah, Scrolls Vember. That's what we're going to do next. But we got a really great Halloween special coming up, so please stick around for that. Uh, it's one of my favorite things we've ever done. Yeah, uh, <laughs> some real shocking, real shocking yeah. developments. So some real, real cool shit. Um, yeah. Uh, any like pluggables for yeah, you? Yeah, uh, I've got a I've got a comic that you can read, and download. Uh, it's about being gay and furry and obsessed with cartoons, but mostly that third thing. Mm. Uh, you can go and check it out on my uh, itch. It's on the link in the doobly do. I also stream. I do art streams and video game streams. That's also in the doobly do. Yeah, they're pretty lit. Uh, see you, Space Juggalo. See you, Space Juggalo. (laughs) We peaked that shit. Yeah, we did.